So welcome to our webinar, uh, Understanding Gender Expansive Youth. I'm Ross Topolsky with the Vernon Area Library, and we're very pleased to have you here with us tonight. Tonight's program is one of our first programs for our One Book, One Community Initiative, which is an annual program we have um, with our two neighboring libraries to the north, Cook Memorial Library, and then to our south, Indian Trails Public Library. And this is our sixth year hosting One Book, One Community where we pick one book and we encourage people to read it. And then we offer all kinds of programs and book discussions and then ultimately lead up to the finale, which is a visit with the author. This year's book is This Is How It Always Is by Lori Frankel. And you will be, will be receiving from me tomorrow a survey. It's kind of our one book survey, but we'll ask you just kind of for feedback on this event and the one book initiative in general. So we are recording this program. So probably by tomorrow afternoon, you'll receive an email from me. They'll have both the link to this recording and you can feel free to share it with other people as well as the survey. So, um, and if you want more information, you can always go to onebook.org for more details and to register for any of these programs. But in the meantime, I'm really pleased to introduce you to our guest tonight. Um, so Heather McCammon Watts is the head of youth services at Deerfield Public Library, just very close to our library, just one of our neighbors. And um, I'm gonna turn things over to Heather and then I will come back for questions. So welcome, Heather. Thank you so much, Roz. It is such an honor to be here. And I wanna thank the Vernon Area Library and uh, for inviting me. Uh, to participate in this amazing one book event. I have read the book. I liked the book a lot. And um, I'm so excited to um, share some, a different perspective with you about gender expansive youth. Um, so I'm about to share my screen. So I will do that. And then we can get started. All right. Uh, let's do this. Okay. So first, um, we're going to be talking a lot about different vocabulary throughout, but um, I did want to tell you, I like to use the term gender expansive to describe uh, youth, LGBTQ plus youth, because it's an umbrella term that feels uh, very affirming, I think, um, as well as uh, it's it's also a term uh, called gender non-conforming youth is a more clinical term that is being used and is certainly appropriate, but non-conforming is, um, you know, sort of the negative uh, aspect, non-conforming, and this is more of a proactive uh, gender expansive use, more affirming language um, for our kiddos. So my name is Heather McCammon Plus. My pronouns are she, her, and I come to you today. I am a parent of two transgender kiddos. They are now adults. So uh, there is not a very good gender neutral term for children that are adults uh, that are non-binary or gender expansive. So um, I just use the term kiddos. I am also a youth services manager at the Deerfield Public Library, and I am a strong ally for the LGBTQ plus community. Just so you know, I am cisgender myself. I am um, cishet, uh, which is, cis means my, my gender identity matches my sex assigned at birth as female. And um, that means that my perspective is limited. I am not, part of the LGBTQ plus community. I am an ally and I am an observer and a listener and uh, I like to bridge communities and help other allies learn how to be a better ally. Um, and I like to talk to other grownups who are really interested in helping our gender expansive youth thrive. So that is why I'm here. So it's very important to make yourself uncomfortable. And I know that sounds a little odd, but uh, stick with me because these are very tough topics. And if we want to break down some um, binary thinking that is harmful to people, we need to feel uncomfortable enough to be able to question our assumptions. That's what this whole presentation is about, is to give you some information so that you can start processing it and reflecting and thinking about your own um, 
your own gender identity and journey and those around you and how our communities can embrace gender expansive youth in new ways. Allyship is a lifelong process of unlearning the conditioning that we've all received about gender. So that's what we're gonna try to do today. First thing is let's talk about pronouns. Um, there's a lot of information out there about pronouns, but the simplest thing to think of is, you know, don't make an assumption. Let the person in front of you uh, reveal themselves to you and tell you what their pronouns are. I don't use the term preferred pronouns because it's just their pronouns like everyone else. Um, so it's important to pause and take your time when addressing someone you don't know um, and not look at their external physical characteristics as the be all and end all. So that means I've stopped using sir and ma'am, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Um, I am a youth services librarian. So if I am talking to a group of children, I will use the more whimsical things. I'll say, Hi, Gumdrops, it's so great to see you here today. What's up, Chipmunks? Um, for the little, they love that, that's fine. But for classrooms, instead of saying hello, boys and girls, you could just say hello, friends, or hello, students, hello, scholars. Um, as children get older into teens, you can just start saying, hey, kiddos, hey, friends, hey, folks. That works for grownups, too. So I would encourage you to mix it up, practice, uh, I intentionally go out and practice. Like um, I'll be thinking to myself, okay, I wanna try a new pronoun um, and see how, see how it works with somebody um, that I don't know. And so go ahead and just approach them in a kind way and say, what are your pronouns? And people really like that question and will tell you generally. So let's talk about the gender unicorn. There are many different aspects of this, and so I want to be very clear. Gender identity and sexual orientation are two very separate things. I am a Gen Xer, and so when I grew up, this was not the case. When I grew up, um, our understanding of the LGBTQIA plus community was still evolving and was limited. And so we learned only a small piece of that experience. So um, sexual orientation uh, was, uh, was being discussed um, as part of gender identity, but they are two separate things and it's super important to evolve our language and evolve our thinking to understand that. So gender identity is what someone feels on the inside. I like to think of it as like falling in love. When you fall in love, it affects everything you do. It affects how you uh, behave in the world. It affects how you feel about yourself. It affects how you feel about other people, but nobody can see it. It's all internal, right? It's the same with gender identity. Gender identity is self-love at its core. And so it is a part of a person that you can't see, but it is such an important and personal part of them that it's vitally important that we respect that and that we honor that. Gender expression is the external way that someone is representing their, themselves. It, it may or may not be related to their gender identity internally. Gender expression, a lot of people play with gender expression, whether they're LGBTQ plus or whether they're uh, cisgender or, or heterosexual, it doesn't matter. Lots of people play with gender expression. It is a way to showcase your shine and showcase um, how you want to be perceived in the world. So that's what gender expression is. My own kids would go through interesting phases of that. Um, so they would uh, say one day, oh, I'm feeling masculine today and would dress in a more masculine way. Or, oh, I'm feeling feminine today. Or I'm just very firmly non-binary today. Um, 
non-binary is not quite the same as androgynous. Um, they are related, but androgyny um, is more of an older term. So think of non-binary as a more evolved, more inclusive umbrella term for anyone who does not fit the strict binary of male, female, okay? Um, sex assigned at birth. This is where the science comes in. And this is what happens when uh, babies are born in our culture. Um, a child is born and the grownups in the room make a decision about what that sex is based solely on external characteristics, based on their reproductive organs. So even intersex children, and intersex means someone is born with um, differing, uh, either differing anatomy or uh, differing um, internal organs or external organs. So they will still choose a gender identity for that child based upon that external characteristic. So I have a little thought exercise for all of you. Let's think about this for a second. Let's say we as a culture don't separate babies by their genitalia. Instead, we separate them and sort them by another physical characteristic that babies have, which is their belly button. So people, human people are born with as innies or outies. So what would the world look like if we sorted people into innies and outies the day they're born? We say, oh, you're an innie, so this is how you dress. These are the toys you're gonna play with. This is your friend group. This is what's expected of you. You're an Audi, well, it's different. An Audi, these are your toys. These are your friends. This is what's expected of you behavior-wise. I think you get where I'm going with this. It's highly limited to sort people based upon such a limited view of who they are. So sex assigned at birth is very complicated um, on a biological level in the animal kingdom as well. Uh, it can be hormonal, it can be a chromosome issue, it can be um, also your internal organs and your external organs, all of those things join together to create a biological sex. And so it's very complicated. And um, the fact that we are not recognizing that, I think limits our perspective a lot as children grow. So the other thing is a sexual orientation is how, who you are attracted to, physically attracted to, or emotionally attracted to. There are asexual people who uh, do not have a physical sexual attraction to others. They instead have an emotional attraction to others. And there's everything across the map on this beautiful spectrum called the rainbow spectrum of experience. So does anyone have any questions at this point? Because um, I know I just threw the gender unicorn out there and it's a lot to process. So I think I'll pause for just a second See if anyone has a question. Okay, so these are some really important things to think about. Um, gender expansive behavior or gender non-conforming behavior is a normal part of child development. Uh, most children do are creative with their gender expression uh, from little, little on. By the age of three, children know what their societal gender is. They also know what their internal gender is. They just may not be able to articulate it, especially if it doesn't match what society is saying to them. So as children age, uh, a large percentage of both boys and girls do explore gender non-conforming or gender expansive behavior as they grow. Once children get to adolescence, it becomes more clear cut about um, whether someone is uh, coming out or um, you know, if they're cisgender, if the cis just means their gender matches their sex assigned at birth. More and more kids are coming out in middle school. 
it's important for us to all recognize that children are coming out younger and younger. And I know in Lori Frankel's book, uh, the child came out even younger than that. And the way that um, doctors designate whether a child is transgender at this point is whether their gender expansive behavior is consistent and whether it is enduring over a longer period of time. Those are the things that they're looking for. So there's a lot uh, to process of all the different um, gender identities, and there is a whole big list of them. You can find them on the internet. <laughs> Everything is like uh, 58 or 72. Um, I found many different uh, types of uh, categorization of all the different genders, and it's just growing. And that's because the LGBTQ plus community is an inclusive umbrella and doesn't want to leave anyone out. So L is lesbian, gay, G is gay, uh, B is binary, um, sorry, yes, <laughs> bisexual, T is trans, Q is questioning or queer, I is intersex, A is asexual, and 2S plus is two-spirit plus, um, or two-spirit, which is the indigenous um, term for a transgender person in some indigenous communities. And the plus is, again, so we don't leave anyone out. And my perspective is, is that if we, if a four-year-old can pronounce this dinosaur's name, everyone can practice, no one can hear you, uh, Micropachycephalosaurus, let's do that again, Micropachycephalosaurus, if a four-year-old can pronounce that, then as adults, I'm pretty confident that we can figure out all the different pronouns and the different gender identities and respect them and use them. You don't have to understand it to respect it. And I'm gonna repeat that again. You don't have to understand it. Like when my kids first came out to me, I did not understand. I was very confused. I was very surprised. But I started with support and love and respect from the very beginning. And then I went and did my research like a good librarian should. <laughs> um, so the other thing is language is evolving. And I wanted to address this question about the Q word, which is the word queer. It has been reclaimed by the LGBTQ plus community. My oldest child came out to us as gender queer. And at first, it was really hard for me to use the Q word, uh, just even just to verbalize it, mainly because growing up, it was considered such a terrible slur. So I had to practice and I had to get permission. And I said, you know, is this something that uh, you want me to use? And they said, yes, this is something I would like you to use. So I put that as my cue. So, the biggest piece of advice I can say for other parents going through this, or you know, if you have a child in your life that is um, gender questioning or gender expansive, follow their lead. Just and it's okay to ask questions, provided they're respectful and loving. But absolutely follow their lead. So the word queer is being reclaimed. Um, excuse me about this by the community, but I wanted to use the words of LGBTQ activists to explain what queer means to them. So this uh, down here, I felt was a really great way to explain it, which is, hold on, I'm so sorry about this. Um, I know how empowering it feels to reclaim words that have been used to harm us. And I appreciate queer specifically because it has always carried a sense of undefined abstractness. Even as a slur, the word describes those who exist outside of what society mandates. So it's fitting that the term now defies all restrictions of love and self that the world has placed upon us. I just think that's a really wonderful way to think about it. Um, and I think it's it's just a really beautiful thing that it is being reclaimed and chosen as a word of affirmation instead of a word that hurts. 
So going back to pronouns for a minute, um, let's practice doing pronouns. It's one of the, the first things, if you have a young person in your life come out to you, one of the first things that will come up is a pronoun or a name change. Those are social transitions that are super common and it's good to be prepared for uh, when that happens. So the first thing is when you slip up, correct yourself briefly and move on and don't do what I did. What I did at the beginning when I slipped up, when I, I would be like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Oh, right. Oh, I feel terrible. Oh, I, I, you, that must be, oh, oh I'm so off. You know, like this whole drama of my reaction. Don't do that. Because that puts the burden on the other person to make you feel better. Because then they, not only do they feel awkward about the pronoun, they also feel guilty about making you feel bad. And that is absolutely the opposite of what you want when you love someone who comes out as transgender. So instead, I have learned over time, if I slip up to just quickly correct myself, that, oh, I'm sorry, do the correct pronoun and move on. That's the simplest and the most kind. When someone else corrects you, say thank you. Again, if you love someone or if you work with someone, um, who is um, LGBTQIA, they want, you, you want to respect their pronouns and you want to learn them. And that means I am grateful when people point it out to me. It's a little awkward, it's a little embarrassing, but it's so much better than the alternative. So I just say thank you and I move on. You can interrupt people and you can point it out as well. I have hired a non-binary um, colleague and people are still struggling with the they them pronoun. They them was tricky for me as well because of the grammar. I admit as a librarian, I'm a bit of a grammar queen. And so I struggled with they them as a singular. But then I did my research and I found out that first of all, Shakespeare used they them as a singular term. It's been around for a long time. And we do use it in certain circumstances. So imagine you are in a taxi and someone left a backpack. You might say to the taxi driver, look, they left their backpack. Can you get it back to them? Right? That's a very simple, singular use of the word they, them as a pronoun um, in a no normal, everyday um, context. All right? If you mess up, then do the correct one like three times, either in your head or out loud, depending on the circumstance. So if I mess up a pronoun for my kid, I would then in my head say, oh, they are an amazing person. They are wearing a blue shirt today and they really like lemonade, something like that. Like I would specifically form sentences in my mind using the correct pronoun and I would do it three times because I'm old <laughs> and I needed the repetition so that I could do it. It took me about six months with my own kids to get to that level of pronoun usage. I still slip up if I'm tired. So I know that. And so if I am tired and I'm talking to my kiddos or about my kiddos, I slow down. Because for me, slowing down helps me so that then I can um, use the proper pronoun. And don't make someone feel like they're being a burden. Don't say, oh, it's so hard for me. Um, it's a, you know what, it's the work of being an ally. It's really not hard, as hard for us as it is for the person who has to explain it over and over and over and over and over again to those around them, just for some basic respect, so. Um, we can, as allies, I feel like it's important that we, we inform others and feel comfortable doing it ourselves to, to spread it around. So family and community support is critical. And as I was saying, like showing proper pronoun use is one of the best ways to show your support. Also, be bold, be visible, be active, be vocal. There's a lot of um, silence around this issue and it is harming our youth. 
because young people, when they look at us as older people, they view silence as judgment. They automatically will assume that if, if we don't say anything, that we are judging them. So it's super important to cut that at, um, at the very beginning and just put it out there and say, hey, yeah, I think that's cool. I support you, something like that. Gender affirming behavior on the part of adults greatly improves mental health and well being. Using proper pronouns, using someone's um, chosen name, all of those things, that is suicide prevention. And I'll say this again our transgender kiddos are at high risk of rejection and bullying and suicide. And, and trans adults are victims of violent crime every day. If we want to have healthy communities, that means we need to support everyone in our community and our transgender neighbors and friends and children are in danger and are being discriminated against. And we, uh, if you feel that that is uh, an advocacy effort that you would like to take on, I would encourage you to get out there and be loud about it. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. <laughs> First, you can foster gender equality from birth. Here is a list of qualities that children have. Girls are scared, loud, nurturing, calm, brave, smelly. Boys are unique, kind, nurturing, happy, silly, loving. Both girls and boys and non-binary kids are all of these things. And we need to make it okay for young kids to show the whole range of emotion, for boys to show love and kindness, and for girls to be able to be brave and tough and smelly, by the way. I remember people telling me um, that, well, girls aren't as, you know, smelly as boys and girls, girls are neater than boys. And I, I remember as a mom thinking, that's just not true. <laughs> so, um, in middle school, all those kids, they just stink up their bedrooms. <laughs> it's just the way it is. <laughs> so my point is there are stereotypes out there that are just not true. Kids are kids. So here's how you can help very young children understand gender and gender equality and not put them into those boxes right away. So be gender expansive about your choices. Um, if you give a gift to a child, uh, give them a gift that isn't necessarily tied to a particular gender, something a little more neutral. Um, clothes, decorations, parties, playtime, the more you see uh, the more the more you recognize it, you see that we gender a lot of things in our culture. You go into a store and there's the pink aisle and the blue aisle for toys, right? And that's a problem not just for gender expansive kids, but for all children. Because like I was saying earlier, all children like to play around with being gender creative or playing with different toys or, you know, imagining a themselves in a different scenario. So we need to open up choices for all of our children. And this is a way to do that. Encourage them in their art and in their play. Like you could be playing dollhouse with a kid and okay, let's play dollhouse. The kid says, okay, I'll be the mommy, you be the daddy. Okay, let's play. Then the next time you play, you can say, hey, let's both be mommy. Why not? You know, see what happens. And that starts the discussion with the kid through play, which is how they learn, in a very natural way. There are many opportunities to discuss gender with children on a daily basis and encourage them to have um, friendships across uh, the gender lines and those binaries. So here are some books to share with very little kids. They are wonderful books being published now. It's just a boom in publishing. One of my favorites on here is called Julian is a Mermaid, and this is a gender expansive child who dresses up as a mermaid. And it is the most loving, beautiful portrayal 
Um, you can read it over and over and over again. Um, just one of my absolute favorites. Um, I love my colorful nails. Lots of kids are starting to paint their nails now. It's no longer considered just a girl thing or even an LGBTQ thing. It's just a fun thing. Why shouldn't anybody be able to paint their nails? Um, things like that are, are starting to change in our culture. And I think that that's a really positive change. Um, as kids get older, we can help elementary kids be gender inclusive in similar ways as we would help the young ones. Take advantage of every opportunity to talk about gender roles. Teach children if someone's being left out to be an upstander and to include that person. Um, if you hear kids playing like, no, you can't play that, you're a boy, or you can't do that, you're a girl, cut it off immediately. Uh, talk about it. Sit the sit the kids down. Have your books ready if you need to, if you want to read them a quick story. Feel comfortable with having that conversation and nip it in the bud, because uh, that is how we can change those societal assumptions. And here are some books for kindergarten through fifth grade. Uh, I want to point out a couple of these. Um, Rick Riordan is a powerhouse in the children's literature world. He wrote a little book called The Lightning Thief, which you may have heard of. Um, he was the first children's author to include a non-binary character in his book. That's huge, and it was very recent. So um, he is really trying to change things in the publishing world and other authors are following, which is just fantastic. Um, the book George was about, it was similar to um, the one book that you've been reading here in Vernon, but it's a story about Melissa, who is being, uh, who is being raised as George, okay? Um, when the book first came out, it was just called George. And the LGBTQIA plus community said, hey, Actually, the kid's name, the kid really is Melissa. They've been Melissa all along. It should be called Melissa and not George. And the author changed it and the publisher changed it. So my point is you have an impact. If you write a letter uh, to your local school board because um, they're excluding transgender athletes, it will make a difference. They will read that letter. If you go to a school board meeting, if you write a letter to a publisher about a book or, I mean, just get out there and if you see something, say something. So as kids get older, as teens, it, um, this is the age where they are very um, peer focused. We all we know this. <laughs> Um, and so you may not hear everything that's going on in their heads when they're teens, but that also means that's a, a tricky age and a potentially dangerous age. Again, teens are at higher risk of suicide, particularly LGBTQIA plus teens. So it's super important that you keep having those conversations. Identify your family's own biases and change them. If you find yourself saying something that is, um, a gender bias, catch yourself, point it out, correct it, and show your kids that process. It's very important. Talk honestly with them about current issues and the history of injustice and bigotry. Um, there are plenty of books out there. Uh, there's a graphic, his, uh, queer, queer graphic history, which talks about Stonewall. Uh, that's a really great book to share with teens. Just again, have a conversation encourage them to keep having gender expansive friendships and gender expansive dating partners. Practice using pronouns. Um, oh, I just noticed I said practice and use preferred pronouns. I wrote this slide before I changed my habits and before I learned that the community uh, wants it to just be practice and use pronouns. So I'm gonna change that as soon as we're done with this. So I wanted to show you that I am constantly changing. We all are. We need to you know, evolve as we go and learn. 
If you don't say something, someone else will. If we don't tell our youth what our values are and that we respect and honor them and their friends, someone else will tell them the opposite and will tell them that they're wrong and that they're bad and that and we need to be louder than that. Love needs to be louder than hate. So here are some teen reads. Growing up trans is one of my favorites because it's the words of transgender teens. And it's a very quick read, very um, approachable. I learned a lot. Um, if you could also go on TikTok, there's an amazing group of kids on there that are just opening up their heart and uh, showing who they are and their experiences. It's just a, it's a beautiful um, evolution to watch. So um, I would encourage you to do that. Um, also the Everybody book is a good one. Um, it's a, it's a sex ed book, but it is an inclusive one. And it, if it's a nonfiction book that you're looking for, that's a great one to start. And, you know, a lot of these books, here's a trick with teenagers. I would just get the books and I would put them um, on the dining room table or in the bathroom or in the car. Uh, because when they're teenagers, they're not going to take your book suggestions. Especially if you're a librarian. My kids did not take my book, book suggestions. So I would just kind of leave them out, you know, in places where I thought they might find them. And they would pick them up and look at them. So that's, that's just a little tip. So the other thing is to talk to our teens who are allies, too. Um, so our cisgender teens also need all this information so that they can stand up for their friends. Um, here is a good way to teach them about interrupting harmful behavior, and it works for adults too. Uh, just practice these sentences so that you're not taken by surprise if someone says something offensive or discriminatory. I'm not comfortable with that. That's not okay with me. I find that offensive. What you just said is harmful. That's not funny. I think that is a hurtful statement. There's all sorts of ways you can say it, but at least just say something, right? Um, Cause again, we need to break that cycle, break that behavior uh, and silence is not consent and doesn't mean it's okay. We need to be loud. So more things about being an ally. Um, we talked about pronouns. Um, if you hear transphobic words or language, you can give people alternatives. Sometimes people use older lingo because they don't know better, um, but they still do want to learn. So I, I don't shame people, but I like, I like to point it out to them and say, oh, did you know that there's a, a more recent term for that? Here's what it is, okay? Um, an example of that is androgynous. I would say, oh, it's not an offensive term, but there's a more updated one. So let's let's talk about non-binary because androgynous was a little more limited and a little uh, to gender expression rather than gender identity. So that's just an example of, of how you can do that. Um, encourage your local schools and churches to form support groups for you. I just did a presentation for a church last week I was thrilled and honored to be there. Um, but this topic is applicable to anywhere that people gather. Do your research and make Pride Month Pride all year long. So here are some books for adult allies. So I like to read memoirs. Um, Trans Like Me is one of the best memoirs I've read um, by C.N. Lester, who is a non-binary person in Britain, I think, and is a singer. Um, and I just, I found it heartbreaking, but also just so beautifully written. Um, once you hear someone describe their experience in their own words, you just want to reach out and, and hug them and, and accept them immediately. That's the power of literature. Um, this is how it always is, is the book that um, you all are reading here at Vernon, also a wonderful book club book, I'm sure you're aware. Um, if you have someone in your life who is a, who could use some resources, 
the transgender child and raising the transgender child. Both of those are nonfiction uh, kind of how-to books, like what to expect when you're expecting for parents of transgender kiddos like me. Um, so those are really helpful for that. Uh, I would say it's good to support the parents as well as the kids because parents, um, when this happens, when my kids first came out, I had a lot of confusing emotions and I didn't know how to deal with them. And I didn't want to put that on my kids and it's not their job to do that. All they saw was the love and the support but I also needed some support. So I found it online. I found it with friends. I found it with community. So that's also an important role for allies to fill is to be a support for parents who are going um, through this journey with their kids. So the reason we're doing this is uh, to raise awareness that there are amazing LGBTQ plus uh, community members out there who we want to honor and we want to highlight and that we really want to decrease the incidence of depression and suicide in the community. And the best way to do that is by normalizing it and talking about it and destigmatizing this issue. Especially when it comes to transgender athletes, that's like one of our um, troubling uh, trends that we're seeing right now is that these athletes are being targeted and these kids are 15, 16 years old and they're being told they can't play. They can't play their favorite sport. They're being told that they're less than. They And we are being lied to about um, what's going on because there is absolutely no evidence that trans athletes have an, an unfair advantage in sports. There's no evidence at all for that. And so get your facts straight, do your research. This comes from the ACLU, they know their stuff. Um, I like to have it out there and prepared in case I'm out and about and someone uh, starts a conversation with me um, that I have the facts on my side. So finally, here are some resources. Um, I really like the Trevor Project. They do um, suicide awareness and prevention work. Also, there's um, queer books for teens. There's the Rainbow Book List if you're looking for more affirming titles. The Human Rights Campaign is a great place to start if you're still um, learning the vocabulary and want some good research and background information as well as some of these other resources. So thank you so much for having me and for listening. And I am happy to answer questions, any questions. Heather, thank you so much for that presentation. You, there's so much to think about. And I just also, the thing I really liked about what you had to say was just about how you shared kind of your journey, how you were learning things and practicing things. And it just made it really accessible for everybody to realize that there's everybody's kind of learning and having to practice. And so I, I really loved in particular that aspect of it. Um, so we do have one comment or question from someone who says, um, I agree that that special pronouns are needed. My problem is related to the fact that the pronouns chosen already have definitions. Why can't pronouns be, oh wait, hang on. Um, why can pronoun, new pronouns be created? Think back to women that wanted to be called Mrs. or Ms. And so Ms. was created. Mm -hmm. We need similar thinking here. So what do you think about that? I, that oh, uh, yeah, it's happening. It's totally happening. Uh, language is evolving all the time. Um, yeah, and I would say that sometimes it evolves into a new term like um, Z, them, which is an XI or an XEM. There are new pronouns that are being created today. But it also is an evolution of language when older words are reclaimed in a new way. That's also part of linguistic change. So even though they, them has been around a while, it is used in a new way. And so it becomes fresh again. 
Um, and same with the word queer, like we were talking about uh, things like that. So I think that there's room for both um, brand new pronouns as well as um, reclaiming older terms and giving them a and buffing them up a little fresher. Heather, one of the other things I also really liked about this was you were talking about um, you know how to support your children and and but they also like how like parents, adults that are also um, kind of trying to help their children also need like their own support, their own um, their own support system because they're processing and going through a change at the same time as well. Um, and so I did want to mention that a lot of the books that you um, listed in your presentation, our library does have. Um, I made sure when you shared the presentation with me that we kind of had, I, I would say we probably have almost all of them. Um, okay. So, um, I, so I don't even know if anyone's looking for any of these books for you're interested in learning in general, or you know somebody in your life. We we Vernon has almost all of them, I think, in our collection. So, mm -hmm. and I was really pleased that when you gave me the list, that there was like we already had we already had owned them. So I was I was proud to see that. <laughs> yeah, and it's also okay for all of us to feel confused and to feel a little sad, or like when my kids came out. Actually, both of them ended up changing their names, and I felt sad about that. And the reason I felt sad was because it was the first gift I gave them, right? And we thought long and hard about the name, and it felt really personal and intimate, right? And um, the name change was hard, um, but I also knew that for them, claiming a new name, claimed a new identity for them and it gave them courage to go out into the world and show their inner self. And so they needed that name to do that. And so I dealt with my own sadness with my husband and with my friends, uh, but, and with my online community of Mama Dragons, who, who's a community of parents who are raising um, LGBTQ plus kids, right? But I guess my point is, it's okay, don't beat yourself up for feeling sad. We can't control our emotions, they're like the weather. It's okay, just don't put that on your child. Instead, bring it to a different venue where you can process it, um, you know, without it involving their, their process. Right. Yeah. Well, I just from, what, from just listening to you talk, I think that um, that your kiddos are so fortunate to have you in their corner. And what a great youth librarian you must be, also to kind of be able to share like your thoughts around this, and you know, with like your own community. So I, they're uh, very fortunate to have you in their lives. <laughs> um, so I think we don't have any other questions coming in right now. So I am going to wrap things up. And again, everyone will get a recording. So if you want to review something or share it with someone else that you think would find this useful or helpful, you'll be able to do that. You'll have it for me tomorrow. And Heather, again, just thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. It really was fantastic. Um, I see there's some nice comments coming in to the chat. So I hope you'll take a look at those as well. And um, thank you to everyone who joined us at home tonight. I hope that you enjoyed this as well and that you'll continue to look for our um, our one book or other programs, book discussions, things of that nature. Um, and then maybe join us for our book discussion on the 26th of February. Bye. So um, have a good night, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.